I would like to welcome all members of the committee and other members and officers in attendance at today's committee meeting. I'm Councillor Edward Heron, Chairman of the HR Committee. Welcome to members of the public and press who may be viewing the meeting live on YouTube. The broadcast will remain available for a minimum of 12 months. I would remind those in attendance to use your microphone. You don't need to in this room. Uh, it's all picked up by the microphone. Uh, so please can members switch off any mobile devices and please remember to put mute the microphone on laptops, please, so that the speaker certainly don't get bings of emails coming in. Uh, for the benefit of those watching the meeting online, I would ask that members introduce themselves before, before they first speak, so members can obviously say who you are and what you do. So with that, welcome to everybody. And the first item is apologies. I have apologies from Councillors Brand and Cazell. Are there any other apologies? Mm -hmm. so, item one is to confirm the minutes of the meeting held meeting held on the 16th of May and the 9th of June of correct records. Is everyone in agreement? Agreed. Excellent, thank you. Item two is declarations of interest. Do any members have any declarations of interest in respect of any items on the agenda today? Not seeing anybody. Uh -huh. so item three is public participation. There is none. So we're going to move rapidly on to item four, which is the leadership review, which is a good thing. We have a lengthy agenda today. I'm going to go first to Helena to introduce the report, and then Kate's here to answer any questions on it. So Helena, can you introduce the report, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, this is the outcome of the leadership review that we've been undertaking. Um, just to confirm, we've been through a very thorough consultation process with those people that are directly affected. We've held um, individual meetings with those people um, and we've also done a consultation exercise with um, service managers and other senior managers who will also be indirectly affected by the changes. Um, I think it's important to note that actually we didn't receive any negative comments about changing from the four executive heads that we have at the moment and moving to having three strategic directors in the future. I think that's quite an important point to make. Um, so as a result of the consultation process, what we'd like to do is move forward. Um, and those conclusions are all set out for you in paragraph five. Um, so three strategic positions, that's uh, one strategic director for housing, communities and governance, one strategic director for corporate resource and transformation, and one for the position of place, operations and sustainability. Now, we've followed all our agreed procedures in terms of the union and our um, redeployment of, uh, policies. Um, what it actually came down to is that two of those posts will be filled by existing staff um, due to our natural successor policy. Uh, but it does mean that one of those positions, which is the strategic director for place operations and sustainability, will be um, advertised, hopefully with the support, externally. Um, to get the right person in place. So um, I think what we've tried to do is position ourselves in the right place for the future so that we can deliver our corporate objectives. Um, and we had some very positive feedback from the consultation from staff who, who felt that that was definitely the right direction that we were going in. That's really where we'd like to get to. So we'd like to propose that we take a paper to council to support the way in which we'd like to advertise um, and recruit to that post. Well, I thought we'd go to other members, a couple of questions. The first point is, um, obviously we have two posts where we have the natural successors, yes. one where we're going to go out to recruit. You just confirm that, that anyone in the organisation is more than able to apply for that role if they should wish. Yes. So while it's going out externally, that doesn't exclude perhaps one of the other current heads of service applying to that process. Absolutely. And secondly, 
okay, I know we think it, but perhaps just say what, can you just sort of say a bit about what you think is different about a strategic director and a head of service in the sense of how is their role? What's the different, what are you looking for from a strategic director as opposed to heads of service, really? Yeah, so I think I think for a, a strategic director, they would be spending perhaps more of their time collectively working as the senior leadership team on the sort of more medium to long term challenges that both collectively we face as a council, but also within their suite of services need to be thought through. So I guess it's about moving from the kind of operational to, to the strategic. I know in a, in a smaller council, you still do operational. I do operational, everybody does. But I think it's about the balance of time. Um, I think it's also about the role that you have externally with partners. So, um, you know, taking on uh, more of those roles. So, for example, housing communities and governance is an awful lot in there around health and well-being, community safety, housing delivery, where you need to be having enough time to be working with partners because we can't deliver those outcomes by ourselves. Um, so I think it, it, it's about the balance of the role. Um, and then I think it, it is that ability when we know that the council's going to go through a change process to to be able to lead the teams and to be, I, I guess I describe it in a nutshell as being above the business rather than in the business. Um, so it's somebody that can lead, manage and direct resources, but also bring an expertise from their area um, so that they can um, paint a picture of what good looks like um, and inspire their teams to move to where we need to be in sort of five years' time. Okay, can I just sort of draw her attention that, that while, as we say, in the financial section, there is a small saving um, from this individual change. Obviously, if you're doing that and you've got heads of service currently perhaps too much in the detail of the operational, <coughs> you're going to have to replace that capacity so uh, so there is actually a memorable note in 6.5 the fact that we anticipate that the overall process will actually cost more money uh, certainly in the short to medium term but i'm sure okay, we're, we're looking at transformation going forward and changing how services are delivered so one would hope that, that, that we will get that back um later so, the, the fruits of these changes and having a more forward looking and, and things, but it is, this is not in itself a cost saving or cutting proposal, but nor is it as it is that it will, in the medium, short to medium term, increase the cost of service delivery. It is just the process that we go through. Uh, with that, I think I've had an awful lot to say. Are there any questions from members? Uh, Keith. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry to move backwards if, if it is what I'm doing. And obviously I've been through things like this before. But uh, in terms of looking at the individuals, how were they measured in terms of, let's call it skills, capability, competences, and how did that measure against the role as anticipated, as described a moment ago? And is that what you use, that kind of process? So you have a sort of scoreboard, call it what you like. So if you look at the um, proposed structure, yeah. Um, where you can see the, the business yeah. units that we anticipate those strategic directors looking after, yeah. what we do is we take a balance of whether um, the existing roles are approximately 70% of what the new role is going to be. Mm. And where we've got that level of match, we would consider that to be a natural successor. Okay, fine. Yeah, as I say, sorry to go backwards. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think, I think it's important to, for I think people involved are, but I think it's important that you're transparent as to how you come to that, mm. that outcome. Any other questions? Martin. Sorry, uh, Martin Levitt, uh, Council for um, Backbench Council for um, um, Brunscombe and Burley. Uh, just a really simple, uh, just when the new candidates are <laughs> campaigning in the election, when this question is asked, can, can, I, can, I, can I tell them to say that, well, we're more in line with the nine other district councils in Hampshire now than we were and have historically been? Um, I, Sorry, leading question. On, on leadership structures, I, mean, I did do quite a lot of research, of, um, particularly into looking at districts uh, and, um, and what's the Other way. districts. Yes, yeah. other districts, mm -hmm. um, and, and shared some of that when we were sort of at the very first stage of thinking about roles. Um, I think... 
this is a structure that that is is in place in a lot of in, in a lot of districts is in sometimes um, it's crucial that it's in Hampshire I yeah, think you no, use that yeah, phrase yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I think um, a lot of areas actually only have two um, and then they so so there's a sort of yeah. an issue about do you try and put all of your services into one strategic mm. director and then you usually have one if you go for that model you mm. have one corporate I think that as a large district, we're one of the largest in the country with an ambitious agenda. I don't feel that, that you'd get the right capacity and leadership um, with that model. So that's where we've gone for looking at really a model that's focusing on people, i.e. housing communities, mm -hmm. and a model that's yeah. facing on place, which will be all the sort of planning, regeneration, serv operational services. So I think... Um, it, it, I'm not sure, I can't tell you, is it exactly the same as every other district? I think they've all got slightly different tweaks. Um, some, some it's still, closer, that's yeah, the message yeah, I want to yeah, go over to yeah. residents. Sort of. I think definitely the strategic nature is absolutely what you'd expect in district councils yeah, okay. rather than the kind of the, the exec head okay. model. Thank you very much. Okay. No, I think it's a good point because everyone looks, take the outside and looks at restructures in councils and goes, gosh, you know, they're moving the dead chairs again. Um, <laughs> And everyone can understand why the public feel like that. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, you know, if you don't have the leadership in place for an ever-changing world to deliver services, mm. the end result is the services they don't get at the at the bottom at the outcome end mm. um, aren't as efficient or as mm. modern or as dynamic as you would want to be. So I, I do quite get Martin the question, and, and as to the numbers, I think again, you know, we've got a range of districts and boroughs in Hampshire that range from you know, about 90,000 to about 180,000. We used to be the largest. We're now the second largest district in Hampshire. The 2021 census basically just opened Dean overtook us. <laughs> um, but I think that, that I think if someone asked a question, you know, why do our neighbour, I think Teff Valley have two strategic directors, if I remember correctly. They ask, why do we have three and they have two? I think, you know, there's a fair argument to say, well, actually, we're not quite twice as big as them, but not far off. So, uh, they are, they, they yeah. are also recruiting just now a deputy chief exec. So I think sometimes people, there's sort of phases where people maybe cut, cut and then realise they need a bit more capacity as well. Um, <coughs> Sorry, if I may. Yeah, okay. I just think looking behind you actually reminded me, it's, it's a move, Martin, to answer your question in a way. I would say what is being done to be more commercially and community focused. End of story. Yeah. Don't go into detail. I also think, can I just say, that when we first developed um, that corporate plan, its first iterations, there there are a lot of things that we have added to that plate, particularly around the growth and regeneration, um, you know, the work in Tottenham on the water side elsewhere, <laughs> and the fact that we need to not only plan for that, that we have always done, but actually, increasingly, we're having to step into an enabling role in delivery. Um, actually, I think looking forward four years from backwards four years, I think we're expecting more outcomes than to, to be in a driving position of more outcomes. So, uh, no, I certainly support it. So, get yeah, more. Yeah, I always <coughs> feel that it's quite important that the public know what we're doing so that we can take them along with us because i think that's half the battle mm -hmm. if you have people on your side and wanting to do the kind of things that you are you get them to go along with you instead of continually bickering and finding the opposition as well um picking holes in everything we're doing if everybody can get going in one direction and you know sort out the aims and the, how to do it and where you're going and who you need, which I think is what's been done very efficiently here, um, you take the public along with you. But we don't want to be this far away thing that just sort of collects taxes and spends them ad lib, as they think, and don't even know where very often. Because I think the more that they know, know because we're a good council and we're doing good things, what we do, the more likely they are to come along. I think so. I think it's also very important that we take our mm. stuff with us. And I think it is, and mm. I'll just finish on that, I think it was really good in that consultation. 
we, we didn't get the negative comment because, uh, you know, it is change and yeah. that is, but I think the fact that, that those consulted in the wide consultation, there weren't any, so, you know, we think you're going in the wrong direction here. I think that is quite telling. So uh, if there's no other questions or Just, comments. Sorry, I'll, one from here. You've got, so, we've got down here employee signed comments, no comments received. Can we say um, there were no negative, no nothing negative? I mean, no comments received is kind of, well, they didn't say anything, but you haven't, it's not. I think that's the formal consultation it, with the union yes. rather than the, the formal consultation with staff. Uh, um, so, okay, yes. So they would have been given a copy of the report. Yep. And it's just that they haven't come back and given us any comments on the report. <clears throat> right. It has been okay. discussed with them. Right. Um, okay. And it actually went to the employee side liaison panel last yes. time we met. Okay. Um, so there may well have been some discussion, but there were no formal comments right. put forward. Okay. The, the good thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, the good thing is that the unions were not called to come in with a member, yeah, because okay. I've been there as well, and it's not very fun, nice, particularly when they speak Polish. It's not easy. Um, <laughs> Michael. Um, thank you. Michael Harris, Portfolio Holder for Business Tourism and High Streets. <clears throat> excuse me. I just want to applaud what the team have done uh, to get us to this stage and the fact you've had no negative comments is, is fantastic. So, I mean, in terms of the starting the strategic thinking through to, to, to now getting things to shape up. <clears throat> Has any thought been given to the titles of each of these three characters? Because I, I just look at them and, and find them a tad confusing. And certainly from a public point of view, mm. I wonder whether they'll say, oh, yes, you're the director for, I mean, it's, yeah. it's six, seven, eight words for each of them. I've no idea. I don't have any suggestions. I just throw it up to say I'm sure you've had lots of debates, but um, I just think it's potentially confusing, uh, certainly for the public. Um, I'm going to take that one because there has been lots of discussion because it is quite difficult. You know, when you've got someone who's in charge of housing, it's, it's easy to say they're in charge of that, but some of it is quite difficult. So, Kate, do you want to comment on the iteration of job titles? Yeah, um, I think if you, if you, it's probably uh, a debate. I mean, interestingly, nobody did feedback around the titles, which which often does come out of consultations, is, is individuals who suggest something different. Um, you, I, I guess in talking about them and communicating them, I'm trying to give a sense of the three different areas of focus, which I do think is people and place and, and the organisation. But I think... If you just have a very one-word job title, then people don't also, that the feedback is, but what services are they actually responsible for and how do they link to the priorities and, and the actual delivery that, that residents understand? So I think we've gone for titles to give some, a balance, I guess, where you're, you're giving some indication of their oversight of services as well as their more strategic remit because they do have to marry the two. But it could even say I'm the portfolio, or I'm the, sorry, I'm the uh, strategic director for place, which will include. I think that there was a discussion around that because, but I think again the problem with that is that whereas councillors might understand what a director of place is, I'm not entirely sure that residents who received a letter or met them would understand that they were equally responsible for the operational services such as the waste and recycling collection service. I think, in my view, is in, in balance, you've got to find a balance between a job title that's three pages long and lists every service, and one that is so short that it, it isn't clear to the public who are to de will deal with them, what they are. And I, I felt that the three words, um, pretty much for each one, was about as, as brief as we could get. And I will say a number of organisations will just have a strategic director place, a strategic director resource, and, you know, um, I'm not sure that the public, when they got a letter from them, would fully understand. I sort of think maybe fully, but will get the breadth of their service. So, uh, yeah, but it is a balance. Right, Remember, I think you know, that one, and I think that was a good debate on a very important case. So I take members to the recommendation at one. Note that this is a recommendation first to the uh, council, um, and 
then a separate recommendation to the independent pay consultant and the recommendation to the council around the pay ban here. Are members happy to agree the recommendations? Agreed. 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 Thank you. All right. Let me go to item five, which is the HR update. Uh, Helena. Thank you. Um, this is our regular paper that we bring to HR committee, just to give you a flavour of what's been going on in HR since the last time that we met. Um, so there's a, an area on iTrent there for you. So we've just completed the renewal for, with iTrent for the next four years. Um, we are still working on what's called single sign-on. Um, so those of you that use iTrend will be pleased to know that what that will mean for you in the future is that you won't have to put in your memorable password um, or the two passwords that you're asked for in iTrend. We're working on that. We wanted it to be in place by July. Um, it's now been rescheduled for a bit later this year, so maybe October time. Um, and we're also looking at um, a learning management system. Um, and we're hoping that that will be in place by April, May next year. Um, and what we're looking for is something that works seamlessly with the iTrent system. So when people attend training, um, it will automatically go onto their record on iTrent. Okay. That's what we're hoping for. Um, there's a brief update for you there in terms of recruitment. Um, it, we are still struggling. I have to say, in, at certain bands, um, perhaps some bands more than others, but it is relatively across all of our bands, really. Um, so it, that's something that we're going to try and address later on. Uh, and at 4.3, you will see we actually went to the Ukrainian event that was being that was held in Bokenhead. Um so some quite useful feedback from that, and we have had a couple of applicants as a result of that for some of our roles. So it's very pleasing. Um, bit there on apprenticeships at point five. Um, so we're currently advertising for our HR apprenticeship and also a ground worker apprenticeship. Um, we've recently closed the accountancy one. I believe there were five or six applicants for that, which is great because actually when we did it before, we didn't get any applicants for it at all so maybe that's more about the time of year that we're advertising those particular types of roles. Um, ABCs, we're now up and running with the ABCs for staff um, and Sophie's got some figures that she's going to give us on how we're doing. Uh, yes, so that's, this is the implementation of shared cost ABCs through the partner of ABC Wise that went live on the 1st of August. Um, so since the 1st of August this is available to all our LGPS members. We've had 98 employees sign up to the portal. This week we've got two webinars happening. One of those was happened on Tuesday, one today, and we've got 30 employees coming on the webinar today. We've already had eight applications where employees have signed up to transfer their ABC to a shared cost ABC. Um, and we went, when we went live, we had 35 employees currently paying into standard ABCs. So I'd anticipate that hopefully at, at least we'd get all of those. But the look is that it's been a really good take up from all employees. Mm -hmm. Very, very good news. Mm -hmm. Really good news, yes. Um, and then lastly on this report is the review of hybrid working. Um, so we need to analyse those results. Um, what I can tell you in terms of getting the feedback, I had a number of employees that came directly back to me through the email system. There were <coughs> about 50 or 60 of those. Um, we also put the flip charts upstairs in one of the rooms here, and we had a box where people could complete the form and put the form in the box. I'll be honest, I was probably expecting about 20, 25 forms in the box. We had 94. Mm. So really pleased with that. Um, so it's going to take a bit of time to analyse it. And I had about seven up from Marsh Lane Depot because we asked the staff there that um, use hybrid working as well. So, yes, some really good feedback. So um, you'll just have to bear with us while we go through, <laughs> go through the results of that. Um, yeah, I just want to say, yeah, I was particularly pleased to hear about the accountancy uh, apprenticeships because 
because you know, for my own profession, you know, going back sort of to my couple of family shops of it, so my uncle or my grandfather, in, in their time, the vast majority of the profession came through uh, apprenticeship professional development type route. Um, it was most of them, um, my grandfather included, um, you know, gained their professional qualifications through that. And I, and I think looking at, 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 you know, from my own side of having to train graduates and things, actually, uh, if you have a newly qualified surveyor who came from that route and a newly qualified one who came from the degree route, um, you know, I'm afraid to say the one who came to the apprenticeship route is probably the one that will start earning income a lot faster because they, they know the nuts and bolts and practicalities. And I think I'm really pleased to see that, particularly through some of our aspects. I think it opens up a route to people that otherwise might not do it. And I think actually for our development of our organisation, it is really positive. So I'm really pleased to see that. I'm a little disappointed about the T-level placements, mm. but um, Kate and I have been meeting with the colleges, and I think that's something, particularly if we're talking about wider skills agenda, we will continue to take up with them, because I think we do need to make sure that those training opportunities are locally accessible. Mm. Martin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, um, I'm involved with the Lewington Career Club, um, and a number of my acquaintances there always talk to me about council. They don't actually realise I'm a <laughs> district councillor. I, I, uh, I try to drum that into them, uh, that I'm not. Um, but um, th 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 I'm just queried about the driver situation. That seems to be the major problem we're having with waste collection. Um, it is, is the simple solution. We have to put the um, pay levels up of the, the drivers that we're trying to recruit to stand a chance for recruiting. I think, is that a fair, naive comment on my part? I think there's several factors that, mm -hmm. that you know, need to be taken into account. The thing is, with the HGV drivers, we are competing not only with yeah. other councils, but obviously with the private sector, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and that makes it quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also about explaining to people when they apply for those jobs that there's, there's quite a difference. We're on task and finish. Um, everybody goes home at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the private companies that you might choose to drive for might require you to do an overnight stop yeah, yeah. and a lay-by or something like that. So, it, you know, it's, it's making sure people have the right comparisons, really, when they're making jobs. But is that a message that's easier to, to uh, convey before they apply? It's, it's something <clears throat> that you could make clear within your advertisements. Mm. You know, um, we're spending quite a lot of time making sure that we do put all the right things in our adverts now um, and not use any sort of negative comments, always use the more positive ones. Uh, absolutely, we need to consider pay. Um, and we're going to come on to a, a paper in a minute which looks about pay. We can pick it up there. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> I, 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 just, I, I, think, I think with all of this across the board, now we've got another paper on other areas, mm. I think. And, I, and I'm sorry, this is not a bad thing for me. You know, if, if you're a supporter of capitalism and the markets, if you're in a place where employees command the market, then well done for them. You know, um, you know the, but we are in a place where, uh, particularly around a lot of key skills, so HCV, LGV drivers, um, some other skills that, that we've got, particularly around planning development, that type of thing, regeneration, um, you know, it is an incredibly competitive market, and certainly from my trips to the depots and talking to people, there are a range of factors here. And I, I will say, for drivers here on our way to the refuge service, I pick up two one is around pay and reward. Um, having said that, a lot of them I've spoken to are aware that perhaps neighbouring authorities that look like they're paying a fair bit more actually their hours are different. So actually the hourly rate isn't as different mm. as the pay appears to be. Um, and I'm afraid the other one I have picked up that I'll say here is, is our working practices. If, if, you, if you work here as one of my drivers, you have to get out on occasions and put throw bags in the back. Mm. And if you work for a number of the commercial companies, you merely have to sit in your cab and press a button. 
and quite a few of the older drivers and people at the gate, no, I don't want to do this. Um, you know, uh, you know, there's more injuries from people picking up bags. Actually, I, I don't want to be in a sack collection authority. So I don't think that's the be all and end all. I, I think it's a combination of lots of factors. But I would say pay and and that is are a couple of them. Um, then could have put any other questions or comments on the report. We've only got a recommendation at one here to note the report. Anyone happen to note the HR update? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Helene, there are lots of you on this one. Yes, yes, um, you cite the Avon panel, Helene. Okay, just to make a point, these are draft minutes, um, so not yet confirmed by members of ESLP is correct. That will happen next time we meet. Um, actually, most of the items that are here today are, or that are listed on this um, set of minutes are items that we're going to cover ourselves today. So unless anybody's got anything in particular that they want to put forward, I think we're picking it all up. I will just say at the, on the last page in terms of casual contracts, um, I have looked at the number that we've got left. It is 18 people that we've got left on casual contracts. Some of them haven't worked in the last three months. Um, so I will pick that up separately with the unions um, to talk about the way forward for those people. Can I just say, Jill, thank you for picking up on leaving that one in my absence. I thoroughly enjoyed it, actually. <laughs> Any questions or comments on the employee side draft minutes? I think most of it takes up elsewhere. No? Then. Thank you. Noted. Uh, so next one is item seven, the extension to market supplement. Helena, you again. Thank you. Um, really, this paper picks up on some of the issues that we've been discussing today as we've gone through. Um, we do find ourselves in a position where we are struggling to recruit, as I said before, at all levels. Um, so this paper is to propose that we extend our market supplement policy, which we already have in place. Uh, when we put it in place before, it was up to band 10. Uh, what we'd like to do now is to include this so that we can use the market supplement policy above band 10. So it will be for bands 11 and 12. Um, we only use market supplements where we feel we can evidence that we can't recruit in the normal salary range. So would like to make that clear um, and we acknowledge that they should only be done as a short-term solution. So the idea is that um, you, you use it as it says because the market dictates that you need to use it but actually over time that should always be reviewed um, and we would like to review all of our market supplements annually um, and see whether or not they should actually <coughs> remain. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know it says earlier on, <clears throat> before you come up with the figures, but presumably increasing the band at 12 by, are you going to keep the supplement at 10%? Yes, generally yes, um, but it does say if you look at 5.2 that mm. there may be exceptional circumstances mm. that we could uh, go slightly higher, but the increased percentage would not exceed 15%. And if we do want to go that high, then there would be um, a conversation with the relevant portfolio holder yeah. as well. Kate, do you want to comment? Yeah, I, I'm just going to clarify, I guess, there's two, two different sort of issues to address that this paper is looking to address. One is, um, I, I think, the risk that we may not be able to uh, recruit key Sort of senior managers who we need to cover statutory functions if we don't have the flexibility to look at market forces for 11 and 12. So that, that's one aspect. Um, we, 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 we don't currently have anything that we're proposing to use this for, but I think it, it prevents that risk and, and gives a bit more flexibility if that should be the case in the future. I think the other, the other aspect of the ability in exceptional circumstances to look at up to 15%, that is um, potentially for any grade where we, and, and I think from my perspective, it's about the fact that there could be really key professional skills. So, for example, in fire safety, that's turned into an area where it's 
it's very competitive. The market, you know, private the private market is looking for the same individuals as we are and it may be that even with the 10 percent that's not still enough so it's just giving us for for very exceptional roles the ability to to slightly go up to 15 percent because on the lower salary sometimes you might need actually in terms of looking at the market to have that bit of extra flex well overall i totally agree in the sense that given the state of the market particularly with as you mentioned key individuals We've got to be flexible enough, that word attraction, we've got to be flexible enough to get some form of attraction from these people. Otherwise, we'll be floundering around. So I'm, I'm quite fine with that. Thank you. Uh, look, I, I think it is, it, is, it is incredibly challenging. I personally don't like market supplements in the medium term because they are just that. And if, they, if the position of a role has fundamentally changed in the market where it is, um, I think, but I think the answer is that you have to, have, it does give you the ability to respond to changing circumstances yeah. and it does give you the ability um, to offer that little bit to make sure that we recruit at the level that we need and would expect for the organisation. So. I am supportive of it, but I'm equally supportive of that 12 month review because I think that is quite important. And uh, I think if, if when we keep doing that review, we sort of start seeing that some skills are consistently, then we have to look at where that banding is and how that is done because it could be that actually the market has moved fundamentally. So, at Maureen. Yeah, I've almost sort of wondered often if there's any way of looking at the direction that market forces is going in and then trying to meet it almost before it happens rather than after the event. Because, um, you know, there's it, all of a sudden, it, it just seems to take off almost in waves. And mm. if you're there in at the very beginning, I think you've got far more chance of getting the staff than going in at the tail end when the market prices, et cetera, have gone up and everything else. I'm probably not explaining. No, I, I, I think you're right. I understand. I, I would so certainly say that. It is difficult. And the other thing is that sometimes there's no correlation in what's being turned out from the colleges and what mm. is needed in the actual workplace. And I, I've known there's always been such a big difference in this. And it's something that's really interested me as to how we can bridge it. I know we've done various things with the colleges and what have you, but I do think if we get ahead of those games, it does help our recruitment. I, I, I would say I think you're right. I think the best way that we do this, to be honest, is, is we do what I think we're doing more and more, and that is that we grow the skills internally wherever possible. Yes. Um, by offering those opportunities and for example let's go with our, our driver shortage we have absolutely offered opportunities to our, our existing loaders to work with us and take the training and become drivers and I think um, you know either that grows your in-house skills and you have that can't do it everywhere it's not possible we take take the fire fire one you know those are very special mm -hmm. We are unlikely to have enough people to do it. It might be we could have an apprentice place, but we may not. Um, mm. So I think one is, is is that, and secondly, I think the other one we do, and I, it is always challenging, but I'm always pleased when I look at our attention. The other one is it is important to make sure that you are a place that people want to stay when they've got to all those skills. And I think again we, we do that, and I hope we continue to do that. Uh, there are other comments I will take members to recommendation at one point final. Are we all happy with the recommendation? Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right, straight on to that bit of making sure that our, our um, staff are happy. Um, I can make employee benefits. Sophie. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sophie and I'm a HR advisor in the HR team. I'm here to talk you through this morning this paper on employee benefits, which outlines the recommendation of the procurement and implementation of the Crown Commercial Service CCS employee benefits framework. So this framework is a nationally procured um, uh, framework that's designed exclusively for public sector employers. 
Um, and the framework offers, as you can see, a choice of nine benefits, along with a co-branded um, New Forest District <coughs> Council um, and Eden Red, who is the sole supplier of the framework platform, which would allow employees to access the benefits electronically. To access this framework at nil cost, the employer needs to take three employee benefits. So sections 5 to 13 of the report outline what each of those nine benefits are. I was just going to take direct to section 15 and 16 as that talks through the external research that we did into other frameworks that are available, as well as what our neighbouring authorities are offering. That research found in terms of our neighbouring authorities that all of those that were asked are offering the historic childcare voucher scheme, which is something that we do offer here as well as cycle to work scheme and an employee discount site. On this basis, the report recommends an initial implementation of those three benefits from the CCS employee benefits framework. So as I've intimated, the continuation of the childcare voucher, this is a historic scheme that closed to new entrants in 2018, but allows um, parents to save for tax-free uh, get childcare vouchers at tax free. There is a new scheme that's available to new parents, but we provide the provision for this scheme of historic. So the continuation of that. Uh, also to implement as a new scheme, the cycle to work scheme, which I'm sure you've all heard of, which is a national um, government based UK scheme, which allows the purchase of bike and safety equipment up to a maximum value that we as the employer would set. That's then paid back over the course of an agreed period at a salary sacrifice, uh, over a sac salary sacrifice agreement. Uh, and then the employee discounts website. So this is a website which employees can either access through the portal that will be available to them or to download as a app on their phones, tablets, however they wish to do that. And that does offer a wide range of discounts, meaningful discounts to both national and regional employers. Uh, to give you an example, those lots of discounts that are available are large supermarkets uh, and, again, national retailers that you would all know, as well as uh, travel discounts, uh, health and lifestyle things, uh, entertainment as well. So it's a really wide-ranging offering. So those are the three benefits that we would initially plan to implement, and then the report intimates that after 12 months we'd review that before implementing potentially any of the other remaining nine benefits. So to conclude, we'd hope that this would, again, um, offer us to increase our range of employee benefits that we offer um, and support us in being an employee of choice and, again, hopefully retaining some of our workforce with different benefits. And I'd like to take any questions. Well, thank you. I mean, I fully support this. I think it's fantastic. The last um, conversation we had, the last point on the agenda was about supply and demand, mm -hmm. uh, um, and there's a shortage of, of, of supply and increased demand, which is uh, why we're having to, to, to do things to uh, uh, give extra payment to, to, to keep, keep, keep new members of staff. Um, and this hopefully will attract new members of staff. My own disappointment was when I looked at the table showing how we, were, how we compared, therefore, with other districts um, and three choosing three from this and I know you said initially for 12 months I said, well, if we really want to compete if we really want to play this game we've got to do better we've got to do more than what other people are doing so you know why aren't we starting on four and then and then move? I mean just you know it's supply and demand if we're competing um, so if, that was all I, I thought it was great but I was disappointed yeah. in the short term I, I think what we'd like to do, we want to start small, we want to make sure it works, we want to make sure um, you know there is an uptake from employees on it, and then we're more than happy to look at adding some of those other benefits. And I think once we've got the framework in place, it would be, I would say, relatively simple, because that's down to Sophie, to add some additional benefits in. Um, and the other point I would like to make, I think, is for this to be successful and for this to be understood by all the staff, we need to do some workshops perhaps mm. down at the, the depots um, and explain to the staff how they go about doing this, what the benefit really is for them. And I would include the ABC scheme in that as well, because I'm not convinced that the take up in some of our operational areas is that good. And I think perhaps that's 
somewhat down to them not having a better understanding of what it could actually do for them, how it could benefit them. I will say I think as across the board, I've done this where I've worked somewhere and you know, signed up for something and then thought, well, did you do it through that? Because you've got 30% off and I will know, you know, I've seen something come through on benefits, so I've never got quite that. I was busy and got around to reading it and certainly hadn't remembered what I'd seen when I actually then needed something. I think, um, and I think my particular point, I think, I think this is a great thing to do, providing us it's widely felt to benefit by our staff. And so I think starting off gently and then since our own formal consultations, finding out what it is they would like us to be trying to do, I think is, is the way to go. But I do agree with you. I think we're probably going to have to step up on this over time and that's, that's equally. Well, there, are, right. there are two yeah. audiences. There are yeah. existing staff and saying, listen, why don't you do yeah. this? And then there are the people that we want to be in our staff who, who are outside yeah. looking in. And if they're looking at a, a chart that says, well, at, at, um, you know, XYZ authority, you get these benefits and you get exactly the same at NFDC and you get exactly the same somewhere else. So, you know, there's nothing to set us apart. Or, I mean, I know there will be in time because we are um, uh, much better than all of them. But um, uh, I just want us to get there sooner rather than later. Um, but that's great. I, could, look, I, could, I, I, could, I agree. Like, I think all of this is chipping away because I have to keep it when I say this, you know, when you're trying to recruit people, there are so many factors that come into their, their minds, what they're paid, how they're going to work, what the reputation is of the organisation and what it might do for their career, what are the benefits, what's the work-life balance. And I think, you know, these are all incremental steps to make us that thing we keep saying, the employer of choice. We're never going to recruit to attractive for everybody in every circumstances you know your family are in a different area i mean we're always going to be challenging against you know the cost of house pricing and locating in in in, an, in this area they're always going to be challenges but i think you're right you know we have to sort of try and tick as many of those boxes and we equally whenever we talk about recruitment we also have to remember that you know the only best, best way to get someone to a role is not to recruit them it's just not to lose them to start with so the retention is equally as important uh, hmm. just uh, a little bit yeah. disappointing i think where the green car scheme comes in the list um, and i'm talking from new milton on sunday week we've got the uk's first electric vehicle show demonstration whatever it is with numerous uh, vehicles being presented it just gives an indication, talking about you know where we're we going, what are we going to be doing. Clearly, this green perspective, vehicle-wise, comes into force, and it needs to be, as with all the other benefits, one thing I've learned, tangible. If it's not tangible, don't do it. I think I think the car thing is another thing that we're looking at because obviously with the issue is mileage, payments, cost of fuel, cost mm. of things. Um, and we have had some issues in the past with it, but we are through, through things, looking at the future of pulled cars, that type of thing. Um, but again, equally, I think, thinking a long way back, we have had the situation where we've had pulled cars that seem to spend most of their life sat there having gone go and blow their tyres up. Um, so we have got to be careful, but it is. But I think this all does, and I think this does reflect that the world is changing and we are constantly reviewing these things. To see what works and, and and you know just because it didn't in the past or doesn't at the moment doesn't mean that as it changes we don't need to keep looking at it Adam can I just say on that yeah, we, do, we do have a car loan scheme as well so again yeah. it's another one of these benefits that we mm -hmm. do actually have available so you yeah, get yeah. A, a reasonable rate of interest um so obviously employees were to choose any an electric vehicle that would be fine you know mm -hmm. if it's applicable for our car loan scheme but again it's just another one that perhaps we need to be a bit better at promoting and and actually raising awareness that, that it exists and, and is available. Go back again, tangibility and visibility, key. And um, the second one, you're, you're wasting your time. As we're sort of updating our intranet side to share, are we, we making sure that we're having a sort of new offer, making sure there's a one stop for people to be able to find everything that might be available to them and sort of saying, look, before you do something, why don't you just check and see if we've got anything there for you first? So the idea when we have that new internet is that we'll have an employee benefits page yeah. um, and everything that is available to people will go on there. Mm. Um, and I think it will be much more visible for, mm. for all staff. Maureen. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's excellent, all that's offered here. It really is good for stuff. But I'm wondering, uh, does it cost an awful lot to run? Is it cost effective? And is there anything else that we ought to have there that other people have got that are attracting uh, staff at the moment? I mean, it's a, it's a moving thing almost, isn't it, with... Uh, and I should imagine it's quite difficult to keep up with, really, and also to keep an eye on what is cost effective and what's moving out and what's coming in. We have already discussed that when we do the staff survey later in the year, one of the things that we'll be asking staff is about uh, benefits, what they think is important yeah. to them. Mm, yeah. um, you know, there's, there's no guarantee we could be able to do that. But it would be helpful and useful yeah. to know what they think are key benefits that would either encourage them to stay with us, yeah. you know, or attract yeah. their, their mates to come and join us in the first place. Mm. Yeah. And just because I think we've always think wrap up, we are stepping up what we're doing with our levers, aren't we, as well, to make sure we understand what we're going to do. And I assume equally with. I don't know, make all, all the equipment, but with, with sort of recruitment exercises, I'm assuming we get feedback if people don't apply to understand, you know, particularly our, where we're sending recruitment consultants out. Part of the thing in, in their reports is, you know, we approached so and so, they said they didn't want, they weren't interested in the position because, now it might be because, you know, they've just been offered, but it could also be, you know, they didn't think you were paying enough and they thought the employee benefits were rubbish. Um, well, you, you're correct, totally correct, and exit interviews, old-fashioned word for it, but they're key, yes. and they're key for anything that is moving forward at the pace and change. Do we have an introduce a friend scheme? No, no, we don't at the moment. I think we used to call it, oh, I can't think of it now. Um, we thought about it, uh, and then so people would get an amount of money if somebody that they introduced to us stayed for a period of time um, but they had to stay for six or 12 months but it, it's not a policy that we have in place at the current time. I think that's again it, it, we keep all a link back to Maureen's point we have to get, keep an eye on them all to see what's effective what's cost effective but again I, I, you know I think all of these things we sort of just keep an eye on the other thing is you know let's not reinvent a wheel let's learn from others nearby private public whatever they are if they're doing really well at recruiting and retaining people, let's just have a quick look and see what it is they're doing. Uh, I suspect part of it is stopping their computer screens turning off halfway through the day. <laughs> um, uh, uh, right, with that, uh, we have some recommendations at 1.1, 1 .1, uh, which is note and support uh, the framework. And... Uh, to note that the third benefit is subject to in 12 months' time. Are you happy to agree the recommendation at 1.1? 1 .1? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. So now we move to item 9, which is the menopause, introduction of menopause policy. Helena, to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to bring this to you today. We've been talking about introducing a menopause policy for some time um, and having lots of discussions with the unions about how that might look. Um, so you'll see attached as the appendix one is the actual policy that we're proposing to put in place. Um, it goes through elements of uh, how people may be affected by the menopause, internal support, and also um, quite importantly, the external support that is available to people, um, you know, it's a time in life when people do need that extra bit of support, I think, from us as their employers. Um, so we'd like to introduce what we call here a brief bite session. So that will be run by the HR team. Um, we'd like to encourage all the managers to attend one of those. We'll be looking at things like what you might be able to do in terms of making adjustments for people at work when they're having these symptoms, just explaining it to people, what does that mean? Um, from a woman's perspective, perhaps just a discussion about, you know, it's it's normal, it's okay <laughs> to just talk about it. Um, you know, five years ago, we didn't want to talk about mental health 
No, it's very much something that we're all willing to discuss and much more openly. Um, and I believe that's where we'll be with the menopause in five years' time. Um, and it's about making sure that we are willing to start those conversations with our workforce, with the managers, and make sure that we offer appropriate support and advice to people. Mm. In essence. Yeah. Right. Well, I've read the employee side comments, and I'd like to make the following recommendation. I feel the proposed policy does not need any additional wording in the headings of policy statement or in the introduction, with the exception of the following paragraph. Menopausal symptoms may also exacerbate existing impairments and conditions that those affected may already be struggling to cope with. And I propose that statement is included in the report. And in relation to internal support, I propose no changes are necessary. I would, however, like to propose that the two NHS websites listed under external support are added to the policy. I found those very well. OK, thank you. I'm happy to second that. Uh, change of the recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, any comments from councillors before we go to... No, I just I think it's a very kind policy. It's been very well thought out looking at this. And um, thank you for putting it in because I think it does matter to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would just say I, I hope that many of the things set out in these things are things we were doing already. But I sometimes think actually it's equally important for everybody to have a policy that shows that so um, I'm very supportive. So with the uh, amendments proposed by Jill, is everyone happy to agree to revise recommendations? Yes. Agreed. Thank you. That takes us to item 10 on the agenda. Members, we moved this meeting to uh, make sure we had time to have this beginning system for the council. There are a number of recommendations in council there. We have now got some other pieces that we need to do. So, although the date is not the same, this is effectively putting the September meeting back into the diaries. But members, are we happy to agree the recommendation that we have a meeting of the HR committee on the 20th of September at the more sociable time of 11 a.m.? <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. And then, member, I'm going to give time for everyone like me who's got the IT to come out of one report and go into another. Members, we have a um, later report um, which was not on the main agenda um, under items I consider urgent. So, if I take members to what is now item. 12, which is the proposed changes to band one and four. And Helena, once again, back to you. Thank you. Um, so going back on some of the issues that we've discussed previously today, we do recognise that we are finding recruitment and retention difficult at the levels. Um, what this paper is proposing is um, we're in a position at the moment where the employer's side have made an offer to the unions of £1,925 on each spine point. What we're seeking to do is to actually implement that um, backdated to the 1st of April for our bands 1 to 4 so that they benefit from that and don't have to wait for the outcome of those national negotiations to conclude. Um, Bearing in mind, obviously, there are lowest paid staff. Um, we're in an unprecedented position at the moment with cost of living rises. So we are trying to do what we can to support our lowest paid, in a nutshell. Um, so if you look at the proposed changes at 3.1, so that's um, adding that £1,925 to each spine point, backdated to the 1st of April. The other three points that we're proposing there 
it's proposed that those would come into effect from the 1st of October. I will make that a bit clearer in the paper that goes to the council. Um, you can see there the cost indications of doing that, and also in the 4.1 in the table, you can see the number of employees that that would affect. Um, that's what we'd like to do. I think um, I would just say I think uh, I think it's the right thing to do. I, I, I think it's it's the right thing to do for a couple of reasons. I think it's right for the organisation uh, in its recruitment and its retention, uh, but I think probably more importantly, I think it's the right thing to do for those of our lowest employees, paid employees in what are challenging circumstances. And I think it's fair to say for everyone at every level. I think we've got to be a bit careful here. And, you know, I know that some of our, our, our lower paid are asked the band are struggling, but actually I think there are people struggling at all levels. And I think that does mean I need to say something about the fact that we have in the past um, tried to implement the employer side offer um, early when they have made their final offer. And, um, and it does touch on it in the report. You know, the offer made by the employer's side this time was an exceptional offer. I can't remember, albeit a flat rate, where we have had a, 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 that level of percentage towards the end. We have had some discussions around uh, what that does to the budget and the potential impacts of that. I, I'm afraid I don't think we are in a position to do what we have, might have done in the past and implement that level across the board in the organisation. I just don't think that that is a, a, a reasonable or prudent thing to do until agreement is reached. But I don't think that um, for all those reasons that precludes us from doing this for our lowest paid employees. Um, equally, I, I think the additional 20 pence per hour um, on the bottom of that scale, but I think is equally appropriate. Um, but I think um, yeah, it is a considerable cost, and the table in 4.1 sets out, you know, there are implicate cost implications for more of this, but I think um, if we're going to balance service delivery, uh, the welfare uh, of our staff and the fact that they uh, need to, whatever support we can reasonably give through the current challenges, um, I think that this is an appropriate um, step to take. So I support the recommendation. And I do just say that to note here that the recommendation is uh, for myself and the Chief Executive to commence a dialogue with the regional union representatives, um, hopefully to gain their support ahead of taking these proposals to council. Um, you know, I, I hope they will. I, I'm sure I would hope uh, whatever you know issues there are over way wider pay negotiation, I would sincerely hope, and I have no reason to doubt that they wouldn't put the welfare of their lowest paid members first in that um, and, and, and wouldn't seek to use them as a bargaining. I, I can't imagine they would, um, but we will obviously be present for us to have that dialogue with them before it goes to council. So. Uh, you know, looking at the recommendation at 1.1, is everyone happy to agree that? Totally. Very much so. Thank you. I think if I might just add, watching BBC Breakfast News this morning, so I don't too often want to say, um, they had a member of parliament on and he was being pushed for, well, when are you going to increase this? When are, don't give me, are we giving everybody £130? The poorly paid, you know, 130 and that lady on where her fuel bill had gone from 30 to 150 pounds a month. And yet this guy was still vacillating about, well, we'll wait till the new prime minister. The fact that you're doing this now, mm. action being taken is a big positive. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, that's great. I think that brings us to the conclusion of today's business. So can I say thank you very much to everybody? I mean, I have a good meeting and we got through it relatively quickly. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.